Greetings and welcome everybody to Let's Talk God in Christ, an Ephetic Reporter Podcast. I'm R. Jerome Harris, your host. Today I'll discuss the subject, where do you go when you die? To heaven or hell? Sometimes I watch those mega TV evangelizers such as Creflo Dollar, Pat Robertson, Rick Warren, Peter Popoff, Joel Olston, Paul Crouch, Leroy Thompson, Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, and many others, and I critique what they tell the hundreds present in the audience and the millions watching them on television. And by the way, they all accept major credit cards. Today, a Sunday morning, I listened to one of them tell his congregation that they can rest assured that they will go to heaven, and those who are not saved face a certain eternal torment in a fiery hell that they define as hell. Hell is not a fiery place of torment. And I'll devote another podcast to that subject, but you can visit the prophetic.com website and you'll find several articles there explaining to you what hell is. Now, this TV evangelizer was telling the audience and TV viewers everything they wanted to hear. They were getting full and drunk on the drug of emotionalism. He wanted to make them feel good, confident, and assured. And those in the audience, usually very affluent persons, nodded back and forth in the affirmative to everything he was saying, flipping through their Bibles and taking copious notes. Most of those preaching from the pulpits on this subject rarely quote what Jesus said about the subject of going to heaven. They ignore him. They ignore what Jesus said at John 3.13, and there Jesus says, No one, I repeat that, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven the son of man now how many people do you know came from heaven other than the one that the world today knows as the son of god not one human being has come from heaven and jesus there at john 3:16 is telling us that no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came down from heaven they ignore what Jesus said at John chapter 8, verse 23, and there Jesus says, You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world, and I am not of this world. In other words, Jesus was explaining that mankind had his start and came from a much lower region than the Son of God. We came from the lower region, and that lower region is the earth. And it is to the earth, or that lower region, that we return when we die. The Son of God did not come from the earth. He came from a much higher region, and that higher region we know as the heavens. It is the place that he had his beginning, and it is logical that he would return to that place. Even John 1.1, a scripture many people know, shows that he was with God in the beginning. And where is God? In heaven. John 3.16, another scripture many people know, shows that God sent him from heaven to the earth. It was not the other way around where the Son of God had his beginning on the earth and God sent him to the earth from the earth. No, God dispatched his Son from the heavens to the earth. Anyone created from the lower region, that is the earth, cannot go to the higher region, that is the heavens. That is what Jesus Christ is saying at John 3.13. Notice what the Apostle Paul says at Ephesians chapter 4 verses 9 through 10. And the apostle there says, What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? In other words, when Jesus was a man, he died. And when he died, like any man who dies, where did he go? He went into the lower region. And this is confirmed because when Jesus died, he spent three days in his memorial tomb or his grave. That's the eventuality of any human being who dies. He goes into his grave. He doesn't go into heaven. When the Son of God was resurrected, it was not a man who ascended into heaven. It was the very same person who descended from heaven who returned back to heaven. He returned back to that high region, to the place where he came from. No human being who was born from Adam, past and present or future, can follow Jesus in this regard. Why? Because we did not come from the higher region. But yet you hear all these preachers and ministers, uh, when uh, people die, stand over their caskets or out over their graves, telling everyone present that their dear loved ones are in a better place now. They're in heaven. No, they're not. 
they have actually returned to the lower regions. And a lot of you who listen to this podcast are fully aware of the scripture that says, from the earth you were taken, or from dust, and to dust you will return. In other words, God formed the first man from the dust of the earth, or the soil, the dirt. And when we die, we decay, and we go back to that. We return back to that which we came from. So it is not true that when a person dies, they go to heaven. And, and the way they try to spin this is, well, yeah, that's true, but your spirit goes back to heaven. No, it doesn't. A, your spirit does not have, how can I put this, personality. If you read in the book of Genesis, when God formed the first man, notice there that the first man, Adam, existed in two states. He first existed as a man, but as a dead man. And then when God breathed life into his nostrils, that is, he received God's spirit, then Adam ceased to be a dead man or a dead soul and became a living soul. So Adam existed in two states, as a dead soul and a living soul. Nonetheless, he was still a man, whether he's dead or alive. And all persons who have died since Adam are still in God's memory. They still exist as mankind, not angelic creatures, because none of us came from that higher region. So what has prompted Christianity to spin this terrible lie? Is it to make people feel good? To fill them with emotion that, and reassurance that uh, their loved ones are in heaven. And those who uh, did not accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are somehow in another place. Uh, this fiery Dante's infernal hell that they created. You see, it's all a lie. There's a scripture at uh, Acts chapter 234. And before I read you that scripture, I'm going to ask you a question. Where do you think God's anointed king, one of his anointed kings, King David is to this very day? I asked this question to 10 people a few months ago, and all 10 almost unhesitatingly said that King David is in heaven. And why wouldn't he be? And then I had them read Acts chapter 2, verse 34, where we're told there that actually David did not ascend into the heavens. And do you know that most of those persons just simply stared at that scripture? It's like their minds wouldn't let them process that. And I understand why. It's because they've been indoctrinated for all these many years through art, film, literature, and their particular religious organization's teachings that when you die, you go to heaven. You see, they, they make it black and white. There is no other possibility. And think about this too. Jesus promised at John chapter 5, verses 28 through 29, he says, Do not be amazed at this, for all in the memorial tombs will hear his voice and come out. Jesus did not say some would hear his voice and come out. He said all would hear his voice and come out. So if all persons have died, let's say all good persons, whatever, however they define good persons, die and go to heaven, and all bad persons have died and they're existing in some uh, fiery hell, then how can there be a resurrection? If you're, if a person is in heaven, if a person's in hell, who's left? How can there be a resurrection of the dead from the grave? It makes what Jesus said at John chapter 5, verses 28 through 29, null and void. The only logical way that there could be a resurrection is if all of mankind who have died have gone to the place where Jesus himself went into the grave. And since all of dead mankind to this very day resides in the lower region, in the earth, in their graves, it makes sense because it is from that place that the Son of God will fulfill this promise of resurrecting them from the dead. So no, no one today, no human today is up in heaven. Moses, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Elijah, all the prophets, any person, all persons who have died since Adam, including Adam, to this very day reside someplace in the earth awaiting a resurrection. I've had people say, you know what? Adam won't be resurrected. People of Sodom and Gomorrah who were destroyed won't have a resurrection. I says, who told you that? What I do know is, if you read the book of Genesis, we're even told how old Adam was when he died. You see, Adam did not perish. Adam died. Now, had Adam perished, that would have been one thing. Because there's a difference between a person dying and a person perishing. If you die, there's hope for you to have a resurrection. Because you still exist in God's memory. If you perish, then there's no hope for you. Because when you perish, then you are erased from God's memory. You don't even exist as a thought in his mind. 
And if one reads John chapter 3, verse 16, that's the reason why God sent his son into the world, not to prevent mankind from dying. No, but to prevent mankind from perishing or going out of existence. Read that scripture at John 3, 16. And so therefore, since Adam died and he didn't perish, Adam also will have a resurrection along with the rest of all of mankind who have died. And here's a news flash. Accepting Jesus Christ as one's Lord and Savior, another lie, does not prevent one from dying. Think about that. There are millions of persons out there who've accepted Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior, and they think they're going to heaven. But it doesn't prevent them from dying. We must be born again from the dead, that is, resurrected. Now, that expression, born again, Christianity makes this so cryptic that you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and get born again. They don't even know what that means. They make it sound magical. It's almost an expression without substance. Even the Pharisee Nicodemus, when he was talking with Christ himself, did not understand what Christ was saying. Because Nicodemus says, well, when Jesus says, well, one must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is like probably scratching his head going, can a, a man uh, basically crawl back into his mother's womb and be born again? See, that's the same mentality and understanding many today have concerning what Jesus was saying about being born again. What Christ meant when he mentioned the expression born again was that a person has to be born again from the dead. In other words, you have to be resurrected in order to see the kingdom of God. Think about the pattern of Christ himself when he was a man. As a spirit creature of God, when he was in heaven before he came to the earth, he was already in heaven. But when he became a man, what happened to the, to Christ, this man named Jesus? He died. And the only way that he could return back into God's kingdom in heaven was that he had to die and be resurrected or be born again from the dead. If a person is born again from the dead, that implies that a person had a first birth. And each and every person who exists on the earth today and who have existed had a first birth. We were born from human parents, beginning with Adam and Eve. I know my mother and father. I know that I was, I had two parents. So I had a first birth. And after having a first birth, I know what's in front of me now. I know I'll grow old as I am growing old now. I'll probably get sick and I'm pretty sure I will. And I will die. When I die, that'll be my first death. Now get this. You have a first birth and you have a first death. Now there's something else that has to happen. You will have a second birth. The second birth is the resurrection. The second birth is being born again from the dead. That's the promise Jesus made to all of mankind at John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. If we have a second birth or a resurrection from the dead, then we're going to have a second death. And the book of Revelation talks about a second death. In fact, it tells us there that the second death and the lake of fire are the same thing. So therefore, all of mankind has a first birth and a first death. You die. We're going to die. And on the other side of that, when we're resurrected, that becomes our second birth. That's our born again experience. And all of mankind will have that experience. This is per Jesus' promise at John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. Read it. Jesus says there, he says, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all, now repeat that, when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. All, not just those who accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. No, Jesus even promised uh, that condemned criminal, that condemned man there at Luke chapter 23, verse 43, that he would be in paradise with him. That man was not a follower of Christ. He was a condemned criminal. He was not a good man. He never repented. He never got baptized as some people think you must get in order to, to be a bona fide follower of Christ or baptized in water rather to be a bona fide follower of Christ. That's another podcast. But once we have that second birth from that standpoint and in front of us stands something else, not death as we know today, but something called the second death. The second death is non-existence. You see, right now, any one of us who sin, we sin because we do not know what we're doing. No one on this earth knows right and wrong. How can they? 
Somehow Christianity thinks that it has the market on morality. And I laugh at that because it, it has a terrible history with this mistreatment of mankind. Its involvement with wars and murder and somehow it massages its conscience as if all this is okay. But no, mankind sins because it doesn't know what it's doing. Even when Jesus was persecuted and executed, what did he ask the Father in behalf of his persecutors and executioners? He said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. So today, we do not know good and bad. What's good to person A over here is bad to person B. What's bad to person B is probably good for person A. If you have entire religious groups out here who feel that it is a good thing to chop off people's heads and to uh, plant bombs. You have other religious organizations or entire nations claiming in God we trust engage in dropping atomic bombs on another nation and in their minds thinking that's good. But to the recipients of those bombs and weapons of mass destruction, it's a bad thing. The man who became the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus thought in his mind that it was a good thing to hunt down followers of Christ and to persecute them and even have them put to death. See, in his mind, so each of us thinks what's good and bad for ourselves. Is that not what the devil said to the woman? That you will not surely die because God is basically afraid that you'll know good and bad for yourselves. Well, look at the result of us knowing what is good and bad for ourselves today. You got nations at odds with one another because one nation says that what you're doing is bad and the nation who is being accused of doing the bad thing is saying, well, you know, you're doing bad. You see, so you have a conflict there when the reality is neither one are doing anything good. So I say that because all of mankind right now is basically innocent and has been forgiven because God knows and Christ knows that we do not know what we're doing. And that's why we take one misstep after another. We walk into one calamity into another. And Christ obviously understood that because he asked forgiveness for his persecutors and executioners. And all this condemnatory preaching out here that you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is not what Christ taught. These are all scare tactics to get people to join a particular religious organization. When you threaten people or you paint a picture of some fiery hell that they're going to go to if they don't accept uh, Christ as their Lord and Savior, that's not bringing in a converse out of love. That's bringing in converse out of fear. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, now while they don't teach a fiery hell, they have another angle that they use to scare people into joining the Watchtower. They say that if you don't join the Watchtower organization, which is God's earthly organization, that you're going to lose out on life because it itself, that is the Watchtower organization, is a proverbial ark so to speak, and that if you're not within an organization, when the end comes, you're going to lose your life. Well, what difference is that type of teaching to preaching that those who don't accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are going to burn for all eternity in a fire of hell? The end result is the same thing. People are being scared into repentance and being scared into joining a religious organization. There's no difference. But once all of mankind stands up again, at the second birth, they have the prospect of either living on forever or perishing forever. And when we stand up in our second birth, we'll stand up within Christ's 1,000 year kingdom over the earth. And within that kingdom, Christ will teach us good from bad. So by the time Christ's kingdom ends, all of mankind will know good and bad. So there will be no excuse. Right now, we have excuse. If we do something bad and it will be forgiven. But when we stand up in our second birth and Christ teaches us good from bad throughout that entire 1000 year reign of his over the earth, we will know and learn good and bad. And so therefore, if we do something bad, we can't say we didn't know what we we're doing. We will know because Christ will have taught us that. And when you do something in those days, knowing that it was a bad thing, that cannot be forgiven. There is no more forgiveness for sins. And let me tell you why. Another reason why there won't be any more forgiveness of sins. Who today intercedes with us before the Father if we do something bad? It's our master, Christ Jesus. Well, think about this now. When Christ's kingdom ends, as it says there in, in, in Revelation chapter 20, verses 6 through 8, when that 1,000 year kingdom is over, guess what? 
mankind will not have an intermediary or mediator to God. Christ himself is out of the picture. Mankind in those future days after Christ's 1000 year kingdom ends will be just as Adam was. Now think about this people. Did Adam have an intermediary between himself and the Most High God? No. He didn't have a Christ who intercede between him and God. Adam spoke to his creator directly. And when Christ's kingdom ends in the distant future, all of mankind who will have been resurrected will be just as Adam was. We'll stand one to one with our creator. And if we commit a sin, Christ won't be there and plead our case for us because we will know good and bad. And when you commit that bad thing, then there's only one place you can go. You go into what's called the second death or the lake of fire. The lake of fire and the second death are symbols of non-existence. You're simply erased out of existence. You don't, if you don't exist in God's memory, there's no way you can be resurrected. All of mankind today exists in God's memory. No one today and no one in the past since Adam is in a state of perishing. In fact, think about the expression memorial tomb. Back in Jesus' day, when a person died, let's say Lazarus, for example, he was placed in his memorial tomb. What is the root word of memorial? Memory. They're placed in their memorial tomb. Why? Because God will remember them. So all persons today who die and they are placed in their graves, whether their graves is within the, the earth itself or in a watery deep, God remembers them. They are in their memorial tombs and they all qualify all of mankind qualifies for resurrection jesus promised this and so these teachings that issue forth out of christianity is a lie that if you die and you accept christ as lord and savior you go to heaven and if you don't you go to a place they call a fiery hell hell or hades is simply the common grave of mankind and i'll talk about that in another podcast as well so my point here is that None of us, no human, will go to heaven. No, not one. Because we are not from that place. We are from the earth. What has the earth done wrong? Nothing. The earth is God's creation. And it is from the earth that God created the animals, the birds, the fish, the aquatic life, and mankind himself. There's nothing wrong with God's earth. What is wrong, however, is what has been placed on the earth worlds what god has done is that god destroys worlds he doesn't destroy his earth he destroys the worlds that mankind places on his earth the world of noah's day that was destroyed with a flood the existing world that man has fashioned for himself one day this will be gone and when it's gone another world will come that of a thousand years with christ being king over the earth that ends then another world comes after his world because then the uh, satan ascends from the abyss after the 1000 years is over and he sets up his throne or his world over the earth for some unspecified time it could be for hundreds of years that's the, the kingdom of the wild beast and then that will end and when that end one last world or kingdom will come down to the earth and that's god's kingdom and that kingdom will never end. Now, for those of you who think that uh, you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior and you go to heaven, that makes no sense from another aspect. At Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, Christ taught us a prayer. And people know this as the Lord's Prayer. And what did Christ say in that Lord's Prayer? He says, you must pray this way. He said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let your kingdom come. Let your will take place on earth as it is in heaven. So what is coming down to the earth? God's kingdom is coming down to the earth. So if God's kingdom is coming down to the earth, what need is there for people to go up to heaven? That makes no sense. And I've asked this question to a lot of persons uh, who claim to be Christ followers and who believe that they're going to heaven and they're stumped. If God's kingdom is coming down to the earth, then why are you going up to heaven? And think about the man Lazarus, Jesus' friend who died. He has spent quite some days in his tomb, in his memorial tomb, and he began to stink. And when Jesus called out to Lazarus and uh, asked those who were present to unbound him in his burial cloth, did Lazarus report that he was uh, in heaven? Did he report that he was in a fiery hell? No, he didn't do that. Why? Because Lazarus was in neither of those places. Lazarus was simply in his grave. He was inactive. He was turned off. He knew nothing. And today you have these liars coming out of the woodwork who claim they saw the light and they died and they, I'm like, no, you didn't see anything. 
if you did see something, then you weren't dead. You were, you were delusional. The wisest man to ever live, King Solomon, said at Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5, that as for the living, they are conscious that they will die. And this is a true statement. I'm speaking to you right now. I'm alive. I know that one day I'm going to die. So what King Solomon said there at Ecclesiastes 9, 5 is true. But Solomon also said when he contrasted the state of the dead, he says, but as for the dead, they know nothing at all. Dead people have no consciousness. They cannot see. They cannot smell. They have no recollection of time that's passed them by. They're dead. I like using this example. Can you imagine a person who died, say, 5,000 years ago? When Jesus resurrects that person, it will be as if that person blinked his eye. Because as a dead person, he will have had no recollection of the time or the 5,000 years that passed him over. So the next thing that he's going to hear, as if it's a one second has passed by, is Christ's voice saying, come out, come out of your grave. Think about that. This is almost like science fiction stuff, but it's not. What a loving provision that is, that a person who has died is not someplace suffering with in pain and torment and heat or in some place of bliss in heaven. No, when the person died, say 5,000 years ago, or 4,000 years ago, or 1,000 years ago, or even yesterday, the next thing that they'll hear as a living person is Christ's voice. It will be as if they blink their eye. I believe that this whole teaching that those who accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior go to heaven, and those who do not, who burn to hell, is a hateful, demonic teaching. It's hateful towards God's creation, mankind. Only the devil will produce a teaching like that because he hates God's creation. He hates mankind. And you have a religious system, an imposter called by the name of Christianity, who's doing the bidding of the devil himself by producing these types of teachings. Christ never said out of his own mouth that those who do not accept him will burn in some fiery hell. He never said that. And if he never said it, why are persons teaching it? You know, they're, they're teaching that uh, your punishment for committing a sin is eternal torment. But that is not what Christ taught his apostles. If you open your Bible to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, notice as I read from it what the punishment is when a person commits sin. And I'm not talking about the sin right now because any sin that mankind commits now is forgiven. Remember now, uh, the apostles asked Christ, how many times must I forgive my brother if he sins against me? And Christ said 77 times 7. In other words, an unlimited number of times. And again, did not Christ forgive his persecutors and executioners? So why are those who are claiming to be his followers condemning others rather than doing for those persons what Jesus did. Forgive them. Didn't Jesus tell you to love even your enemies? You're condemning your enemies. You're not forgiving them. Are you not? And if you condemn them, that's not love. Stop listening to these so-called ministers of light from the pulpit who are telling you and teaching you something that the master did not teach you. If Christ says love your enemies, love them. If Christ says do good to those who do evil to you, Listen to him. If Jesus says, forgive those who trespass against you 77 times 7, then do it. If Jesus forgave his persecutors and executioners, then do the same as he did. Don't condemn them because he didn't. Recall the woman, the adulterous woman who the who's found guilty of adultery and she was going to be stoned. And a crowd gathered about her, old and young, they had rocks in their hands and they're about to stone her to death. Christ is sitting there and he's writing in the dust of the ground with a stick. And personally, I believe that Christ was writing the names of all the hypocrites who were present in the ground. And then, um, and I'm sure that they were curious as to, you know, what he was doing. Then Christ says, let he without sin cast the first stone. And guess what? You know the rest of the story. This is at John chapter 8. And the oldest from the youngest departed from that place where this woman was going to be executed. And then all who were left were just Jesus and this woman. And what did Jesus say to this woman? He said to her, woman, who condemns you now? She says, no one. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. See, so in his mind, Christ didn't condemn anyone. 
And if he didn't condemn her, what did he do? He forgave her. And if that woman had turned around and went and done the same thing again, guess what Christ would do? He would forgive her again. He's not going to tell his apostles to forgive those who trespass against them seven, seven times seven, and he doesn't do the same. He'll forgive her. Why? Because he knows that we do not know what we do. We sin because we're imperfect. We don't know good and bad for ourselves. We're weak, but yet the religious system called by Christianity and its membership are quick to point a finger and condemn. How hypocritical is that? But let me read for you the words at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, where it talks about the punishment for committing the unforgivable sin. There the apostle says, God is just, and he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled, and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord is revealed from heaven in a blazing fire with his powerful angels. This has not happened yet. So this is going to occur at the revelation. And it says here, now, now pay careful attention to this. Now pay close attention to what I'm about to say. And quote here. He will punish those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Now I'm going to tell you something. A lot of people out there right now claiming they're preaching some good news of the kingdom or gospel message. What is that message? Where is it written? And where is, does it say that God will entrust imperfect mankind to preach his perfect message. I know this, that at Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, we're told exactly who will be given that good news of the kingdom message and who will preach it. And it's not humans. And it's not a human. It's not even angels. It's one angel. God will give one angel the good news of the kingdom to declare it to the earth. No human will preach God's a kingdom message. It's too important and God hasn't given it yet. So what is this message that people are claiming that they're, that they're preaching? You hear, you see a fix to Bible books that such as the gospel according to Mark, the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to John. Those persons didn't have their own gospels. What is that? That's what the European man put on there. There is no gospel according to John, Luke, Mark, and Matthew. It's all, that title is made up. There's only a gospel according to Christ and a gospel according to the Most High God and the gospel of the kingdom. And they're all related. Those men don't have their own particular gospels. But back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, and I'll pick up where I left off. Notice what their punishment here is. It says that their punishment is not eternal torment, but it is being eternally destroyed. That's a big difference. Eternal torment means a person would have to be alive in order to have senses to feel pain, heat, and other types of torment. But there, at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, we're told that the punishment for that future sin that cannot be forgiven is everlasting destruction. In other words, being wiped out of existence. That is what the second death is and the lake of fire. In fact, the second death means the lake of fire. So the religious system called by men in Christianity has been lying to you. It stands in place to lead you away from the truth about God and Christ. And in fact, it actually opposes what Christ taught by teaching the opposite of what he taught and even making up their own teachings and pushing them off as truth. The religious system called by men in Christianity is, in my view, an imposter. It is the imposter Christ foretold would come on the basis of his name and mislead many. And Christ mentions this at Matthew chapter 24, verse 5. In my view, Christianity is a ravenous wolf in sheep's clothing that gives a very good appearance of being godly and Christ-like. That it opposes Christ by virtue of what it is teaching makes it an antichrist. In fact, the word oppose means anti or against. Christianity is in opposition to Christ, and millions are blinded to that fact. Yet many are mentally in captivity to this imposter and have been sucked into its vacuum. And it is a very difficult thing to open the eyes and ears of those who have been sucked into this religious system. 
Sadly, many within the prison walls of this religious system take on the very same characteristics of the religious system. They become vicious and defensive when the truth about Christ is thrown in front of them. In other words, if I were to say to them, you know, uh, Jesus is not God. He's the son of God. They get vicious. They get defensive. They get emotional. And that's how the religious system called by Christianity prepares its membership. It makes them emotionally drug person. Have you ever tried to reason with a person who's drunk in alcohol? It's difficult to do. So what Christianity does, it makes its membership emotionally drunk. And when a person is emotionally drunk, they're not going to respond back to you with reason. They're going to respond back to you with emotion, insult, name calling. And whenever you give them meat, or well, that is the teachings of Christ, the truth, like a wolf who gets a scent of that blood-filled meat, wants to tear it apart and devour it. In other words, destroy it so that it'll never be spoken. The problem Christianity will have is that they will not be able to tear apart the truth of Christ's words. They're too strong. The double-edged sword of the truth cuts deep, and Christianity will not be able to stand up against it. It cannot. And since it knows that it cannot, rather than deal with the truth, it turns on the persons who are bearing the truth to you. They become the objects of attack. So think about the things that I've said here. Will you go to heaven or to a fiery hell when you die? No. You'll go back to the place from where you came, that lower region, the earth, your grave. So rest assured that if you have relatives or loved ones who've done bad things, that they're not in some place being tormented. They're not in heaven either. They're simply in their graves awaiting a resurrection because the things that they did, they did it not knowing what they're doing. And when people say, you know, say, oh yeah, that person knew what he was doing or she knew what she was doing. No, none of us know that. Yeah, you know, we, we can define what's good and bad for ourselves. In fact, mankind made up laws to define for himself what's good and bad. You know, it's, it's good to stay below the speed limit. It's bad to go over the speed limit. But see, those are rules that mankind established for himself. Those are not God's laws. And if a person, say, go past, you know, goes past the speed limit, that person hasn't sinned against God. They've sinned against the, the ones who created those laws. Those are not God's laws. Now, I'm not saying that a person should go out and purposely break those laws with this, you know, thinking that, oh, hey, since this law is not God's law, I can break them. No, don't do that. Because if you do that, then you're going to be uh, subjected to punishment from the one or ones who create that law. So you want to exercise wisdom in this regard. But at present, all of mankind who have died since Adam, to include Adam, await in their graves until Christ calls them out on that great and inspiring day of the resurrection. This is R. Jerome Harris. Thank you for listening.